strengthen them, God, and help them as they go through their day, dedicating their lives in your service, and help us to do just that here where we live. Help us to be shining lights and examples for good. Please bless our local congregation as you have so richly, and please continue to do so. Bless our elders and their decision-making and our deacons as they work to serve you and each member. There's all, all of us can find something to do. There's so much work that needs to be done, and we thank you for those who do such a good job in carrying out your work. We ask that you continue with us, God, as we go through this worship service. Help us to keep focus on you and your son. And most of all, we thank you for Jesus Christ dying for us so that we may live with you in heaven. We ask forgiveness for our sins that put him on the cross. We thank you, God, for that sacrifice. And we pray to you in his name. Amen. If you'd like to mark number 58, Five eight. That'll be the song of invitation. One of the greatest hymns that is in our song book is uh, 723, and it was always led by my dear uncle Richard Wheeler, a hero of my faith. Let us stand. Oh Lord, my God, when I Good to be here today and to be back home. Enjoyed a good meeting with the Oxford congregation last week. Had those who were not members of the body of Christ present at every service. So uh, we at least know the gospel was proclaimed to those uh, who are, have not at least to this point. Uh, rendered obedience to it, and, and that's always a good thing because that's one of the main purposes of a meeting such as that is to uh, reach out to those whose lives are not what they need to be and not uh, in that covenant relationship with God. I was, I was shocked uh, Monday night. I, I, well, I was doubly shocked Monday night because uh, Martin and Connie drove over and 
uh, came to hear me and I told somebody when I got up to speak, I said, you know, that's, that's something because those people have to listen to me all the time. <laughs> and so, uh, but they came over and that was a, a pleasant surprise, but uh, I was really, really shocked uh, to discover that my sixth grade teacher had come to hear me, uh, who was not a member of the Lord's Church, and um, she was just uh, very special to me. Uh, one of those, you know, everybody seems to have at least one teacher that you just, uh, you couldn't forget them if you tried, and they just really, really made an impact on you, and, and Miss Johnson certainly did that for me. Uh, I had my, uh, an aunt of mine come two different services, Tuesday and Thursday, my mom's sister, and then my mom's brother uh, shocked us all on Wednesday and came out to hear me. So it was a good meeting. Uh, I was thinking about, uh, we are closing the meeting out. In fact, this is the last time I preached uh, before today. It was Thursday night, and I was preaching about what happens when we die. And I'm just in, in mid-sermon, and out of, I don't know if it came from the baptistry or if it came from the projector screen, but it had to be the biggest June bug I've ever seen in my life. It just came out, and all I hear is, and I look up, and there's that thing, and, and he's all over the auditorium, and it got me, uh, you know, I couldn't even hardly think of what I was going to say next, and so I finally said, you know, kind of said something about it, and as I was thinking about that later, and I thought I was like Job, the, the thing which I greatly feared had come upon me. I, you know, I'm, I'm up there talking about death, and here comes this thing out of just nowhere, and I, I just I didn't know what to make of that. But it was a good week, and I enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm just thrilled uh, to be back here today. It's always good to be home and to be with my home congregation. We have visitors, and of course, we, as, as has already been mentioned, want to welcome them. Appreciate your being here with us. Uh, this, this coming, well, when is it? Fourth uh, of July, when is that? Is that Friday? I just went blank. I don't know what day of the week it is, but it's coming. <laughs> uh, but coming up is Fourth of July, and I was, I was thinking about this. I ran across uh, that kind of an idea, so I can't take credit for the idea, although I, I sort of developed it into a sermon, but I thought about that. I, I saw it several months ago, and I thought, you know, that would make a good sermon leading up to or right after or right before the 4th of July. And so uh, thinking about uh, the, the flag of our country. Now, we understand that uh, there are many things that are not right with our country, not where they need to be. In fact, I believe it's been this past week, is that right? Uh, Brother Gary, that uh, Brad Harab and them have been on the steps or, or, uh, or the White House lawn, or I guess as close as you're allowed to get, is this week. Uh, it's, and I think it may still be going on. But uh, they've been out there and they've been, uh, they've set up a PA system and they're, they're preaching and, and reading scripture and things like that and at least putting forth that effort to try to get folks in Washington to listen. I understand that they were able to set up a Bible study with the folks that uh, that they rented the AV equipment from and the po folks that set that up, they sat and listened for a while and then now they have a Bible study set up with them. A lot of things wrong with our country that need to be corrected. But we also know there are a lot of blessings that we enjoy here in this country that, that other folks in the world don't enjoy. And so as, as we prepare to celebrate Independence Day, I think there are some things that we can very much be thankful for living in this country that other folks uh, don't have that to be thankful for. I don't, some of you may have read on Facebook or emails or otherwise but uh, my wife used to live in Ukraine, and it's not the same city, but in Gorlovka, they have had a church building seized by Russian troops. Uh, they came in, they seized the building. They, they came in and announced, the commander of those troops announced to them, we're taking over this building in the name of the, the Russian army. And they said, you've got three hours to get your stuff and get out of here. And, and oh, by the way, they had troops standing at the gate so that when they left, they would certain things, they would say like a photocopier or furniture or something like that, they'd say, oh, no, no, you can't take that. And so if it was something they felt like they could use, they said, no, you can't take that. Bibles and stuff, they would let them take because they had no interest in that. But that, that, at least as of right now, that can't happen in our country. And so we're very thankful for that. And we know patriotism can, can turn sinful as we read about in the book of Jonah. Here's a man who was very patriotic toward his country. It, it turned sinful in that he didn't want the Ninevites to repent. He wanted to see them be destroyed. But we also understand that there is a, a what we might call a, a healthy level of patriotism. And so, uh, you know, we often say the flag stands for freedom. There's an old Lee Greenwood song, he says that. The flag still stands for freedom, and they can't take that away. But I think when we look at the flag, we can be reminded of spiritual freedom as well. In fact, I, I think too often the only time we're thinking about spiritual things and thinking about God and the church and his son and the Holy Spirit and things of that nature are when we're 
in the confines of this building. We ought to have spiritual things on our mind at all times. And so I, I, I love when I get an idea and I can develop it of something that we see a lot that we can make a spiritual application because hopefully when you see those things, then you can, you can have God more in the front of your mind instead of just in the back of our minds or, or just on our minds when we come to services. And so I want to look at a lesson thinking about how the flag reminds us. The flag reminds us of, of several things, and I've got to get my monitor on here. And I think there's an application that can be made. In fact, I found one of these back there on the table, and I was, but I ended up with a PowerPoint, so I, I've, I don't know if I need that. But we see the flag here, there, and everywhere around our country, and it, and it does. It reminds us of freedom. But it also reminds us of a spiritual freedom. And, of course, you know John 8, 32. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth that Jesus came down to this earth to bring, and, and not just to bring, Jesus is really the very embodiment of truth. And that is what gives us spiritual freedom. Sin shackles, it confines us. And, and we, we looked at that not all that long ago in a sermon, looking at sin, what it is and what it does to us. But Jesus comes and he offers freedom. Uh, you know, one of the things that we talked about at, at Bible camp last week, not last week, the week before, but one of the things that we talked about, the theme kind of for the week is what's better, and then kind of a tagline with that, it's not complicated. If you offer somebody, would you rather be a slave or would you rather be free? Well, that's not complicated. That's an easy choice. Uh, any, any sane person chooses, I want to be free. Jesus comes along to people confined by sin, and he offers freedom. Well, let's look at the flag and see how it can remind us of some things spiritual in nature. Uh, notice, first of all, I don't think I got control of it, Jake. There we go. The white stripes remind us of purity. Now, you think about the stripes, and, and, and generally speaking, if, if the flag is what it's supposed to be, these, these stripes are white, they're untainted, and when you think about that untainted white, that is something that no human can boast of. There's not a one of us here, at least of accountable age and, and mentally capable, who can say, I am just as pure as the driven snow. I am untainted. Because Romans 3.10 says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, sometimes people try to make that, that application over into um, the church, and I don't, I don't believe that application is there because uh, what, what, it, what we learn from 2 Corinthians 5.17 is uh, we can be made, we can become the, or 2 Corinthians 5.21, we can become the righteousness of God in him. But he says, looking at, Paul, of course, and, and you've heard me say this before, in Romans 1, he concludes that Gentiles are under sin. In Romans 2, he concludes, well, don't, don't get boastful, Jews, because you're under sin as well. And in Romans 3, he concludes, everybody's under sin. And so there's not a person who is righteous in the sense that can say, I don't need a Savior. Nobody. And, of course, Romans 3.23 just spells it out for us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when I see those stripes, I'm reminded of that, that purity. But uh, not only that, I know that sin stains that purity. That's why no human can boast of it, because we all have sinned. Sin stains the soul. Isaiah 118, Isaiah uh, speaking, it's God speaking through Isaiah. He says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as wool. Though they be red, uh, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Here, here's a person whose soul is stained, marred by sin. God says, I can make it white as snow. Sin stains us, but of course it also separates us from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, we've noticed this numerous times before. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Sin separates us from God. When I reach an accountable age and of understanding, then I become... Once I commit sin, I become separated from God, and I'm in need of redemption or forgiveness. And the Bible uses various terms to describe that. But we need, we need to be made right with God. 
There's only one person who ever lived a 100% a pure life. As I think about the white and the purity, there's only one person who can claim, rightly so, that he is 100% pure, and that's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The only person ever in the history of man, and if the world continues for another 10,000 or however long, he will be the only human ever to be able to say that. In John 8, 39, Jesus said in that verse, he said, which of you convinceth me of sin? Jesus says, I want to know who can convince me of sin. I think I said verse 39, verse 46, John 8, 46. I could never stand here and say such a statement because I know that I've made mistakes in my life. I would not dare to stand before an audience such as this, especially anybody who knows me at all, and say, hey, who, who here can convince me of any wrongdoing whatsoever in my life? <laughs> I wouldn't do that. There would be hands going up right and left. I could tell you a few. And, and the same could be true, of, could be said of any of us. Jesus is the only one 100% pure. 2 Peter 2, 21 and 22 says, Even here and too were you called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Verse 22 says, Who did no sin, neither was there guile found in his mouth. Hebrews 4, 15 says, We, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he has made him to be sin, a sin offering for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And because of Jesus' sinless perfection, that's why 1 Timothy 2.5 says there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Why cannot just any person mediate between God and men? Because only one person is qualified for that, and that's Jesus Christ. So when I see the, the white stripes of the flag, I'm reminded of the purity of Christ, and I'm also reminded that I, I don't have that purity and how thankful I am that he came to this earth and he lived a sinless life to be able to offer us salvation. Well, let's notice number two, the red. Of course, the flag has white stripes, but it also has red stripes, they remind us of blood. You see, blood is the price of sin. Romans 6.23 said the wages of sin is death, first part of that verse. And Leviticus 17.11 tells us the life of the flesh is in the blood. And so you give your blood, you shed out your blood, and it doesn't take all that much blood. It doesn't have to be all of our blood, but you shed enough blood and you've, you've given your life. And many times that's that's used to represent giving someone's life. Sometimes we say uh, on holidays like Veterans Day, Memorial Day, that we honor those who shed their blood for this country. Well, most of the time we understand that to mean, in many cases, they gave their lives. But when I think about this in the spiritual terms, that is the price of sin. It's, it's blood. Wages of sin is death. Well, how long before I can atone for even one of my sins. I can't. And that's why we often talk about the horror of hell is its eternity. The greatness of heaven is its eternity, and yet that's the horror of hell. Because I could never, even in, 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 in an eternity, atone for even one single sin that I've committed. That's the price of sin. It's, it's blood. But here's the good news is that Jesus paid the debt for me. And that's the rest of Romans 6.23. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Peter 1.18 and 19, uh, Peter says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, your vain manner of life, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Peter says, I want you to know Someone didn't come with enough money and purchase your salvation. It came at a high price. The price was blood. Not just blood. If you or I were even capable of dying for someone's sin, that'd be one thing because we've all committed sins. If we're, uh, if we're mentally accountable and of that maturity, we've all committed sin. And so it would be a rightful death. But here's a man, Jesus, who committed no sin. We already noticed the purity 
And yet he shed his blood for you and for me. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9. Let's notice a few verses here. As you're turning there, 1 Peter 2, 24, the latter part of that verse, Peter says, by whose stripes, King James Version, you were healed. It's actually singular in, in the original Greek, by whose stripe you were healed. Now, sometimes that can be translated wound, but I've also heard preachers make the point, and I think there's something to that, that literally Jesus was beaten to the point that it was no more stripes on his back. It was just one massive wound. The Bible doesn't talk about multiple wounds on his back there. It's talking about one, one wound. Well, we know he wasn't hit just one time, but it's to the point. It was like one gigantic wound on his back. And that drives home in our minds, or at least it should, that the price of sin is blood. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, but let's begin at verse 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. And, and, and a good thing, because if it's on the same page in my Bible, but if you notice chapter 10, verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. But he says... Not, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now drop down just for time's sake to verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. That's the price of sin, folks. There's no remission without the shedding of blood. And the blood of goats and bulls couldn't do it, chapter 10, verse 4. And so we often use the illustration, they're rolling forward year by year, but they're not being taken away in, in reality other than in promise because it had to be the blood of Christ. He goes on, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things... And the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Remember, well, that's one of the key words of Hebrews, the key word, really, better. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are, just, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He's there for our sakes, for our benefit. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's the price of sin. It's, it's blood. And Jesus came along and he paid the debt for you and for me. We can take advantage of that now if we come to him on his terms. And once we do that, having obeyed the gospel and entering into that covenant relationship with God, we know that for, for faithful Christians, if we walk in the light of his word, he continually cleanses us. His blood continually cleanses us. He washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelation 1, 5. But in 1 John 1, 7, it says if, and that's conditional, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So it's a continual cleansing that we have if we are faithful in Christ Jesus. That's the price of sin. And that's the price that Jesus came and willingly paid for you and for me. And so the red reminds us of blood. We've often talked before, in fact, I've preached an entire sermon about it, about how to come into contact with the blood. I've told you the story about Brother Keeble and preaching the meeting and uh, someone kept... Uh, standing up, actually standing up during his preaching and saying, you know, quit talking about baptism and water. It, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what takes away sin. And Brother Keeble making the point that, yes, it is the blood that takes away sin. You're absolutely right. But, of course, the question that he asked for her was, where do you reach it? Where do you reach it at? Was the exact way he put it, as Brother Brinkley told me. How do you come into contact with the blood? Blood is the price of sin, and ironically, blood is what purchased our redemption, but I've got to come into contact with it if it's going to do me any good. So how do we come into contact with it? And that's what we talk about sometimes. We call it the gospel plan of salvation or how to be saved or steps to heaven, however you want to put it.
but it's believing in Jesus Christ. He says if we don't do that, we die in our sins. John 8, 24, it's repentance, and that's turning away from self and sin and turning to God and saying, I'm giving my life to him. Again, if we don't do that, we perish, Luke 13, 3 and 5. It's confessing Christ's name as Lord. And he says if we're not willing to do that, he's not going to confess us, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. But it's being baptized into Christ. He said, my blood shed for many for the remission of sins, Matthew 26, 28. On the day of Pentecost, when they cried out, what shall we do? They were told, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. Same wording in those passages, Jesus' blood was shed in order that we might have the remission of sins. We are baptized into Christ in order that we might obtain the remission of sins. We already noticed Revelation 1, 5, he washed us from our sins in his own blood. Acts 22, 16, Saul of Tarsus was told, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Somebody says, Chad, it sounds like you're talking baptismal regeneration. I'm absolutely not. I'm talking regeneration by the almighty Son of God. But I've got to come into contact with his blood the way he says to do it. And he says you must believe that he is the Christ. You must turn away from your sins and yourself and give your life to him. Confess his name as Lord, and when we're buried in that watery grave, we're raised up to walk in newness of life. Why? Because now I'm in contact with the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. The red reminds us of blood, and it reminds us that that's the price that was paid for your sin and for mine. Well, let's go on and notice that the blue, I didn't have room to put it on the slide, but the blue background, you know, we see the stars, but the, they're on a blue background here. Blue makes me think of royalty. It makes us, makes us think about royalty. You see, Jesus is the Son of God. He, he's God's Son. And Matthew 17, 24 to 27, they, they come into Capernaum, and, and those that receive the tribute money for the synagogue, they receive this tribute money, and they, they ask Peter, they say, does your master not pay tribute? And, and Peter doesn't bother to ask Jesus. He just says, oh, oh, of course. And he, he's, he's worried about offending these Jews, you know, so he says, oh, yes, sure, he paid. And so Peter kind of, or Jesus rather, kind of takes uh, Peter aside he, before they go inside. He, Jesus, King James says, prevented him, just means he goes before him. And he says, what thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? You know, if you live in a kingdom where there's a king, and the king's taking up taxes, does he come to his son and say, pay up, boy. I got to get your taxes. Come on. Well, you know that's not the way it works. And, of course, that was Peter's response. He says, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free. And, of course, he tells them, you know, to, lest we offend anyone now that you've already said, yes, he pays tribute. He says, go and you'll find a fish. The first fish that you take up, he's going to have a coin in his mouth. And you, you go and you pay that for me and for you. But Jesus makes a point. He is the son of the king. So he's not subject to the tax. He's royalty. John 3, 16, Jesus himself says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He's, he's God's son. That makes him royalty. And let somebody say, well, that's Jesus saying that. When he was baptized, Matthew 3, 17, as he comes up out of the water, the spirit descends in the form of a dove. And there's Jesus coming up out of the water. And then a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. It happened again on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, verse 5. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And Jesus in Matthew 28, 18, Following his resurrection, he comes to them and he says, All authority, all power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Why? Because he is the son of the king. He's royalty. Make no mistake about it. He came to this earth, he lived and he died as a man, but not just a man. He came as royalty. He's referred to in Revelation 17, 14, 19, 16 as king of kings and lord of lords. Isaiah 9, 6, you know the prophecy. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, royalty. But here's the great thing, folks. We can be God's children. That makes us 
not even in the same category as Jesus, but we can be in the household of God. And God says, if you're my children, then in that sense, you're royalty as well. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God, 1 John 3, 1. Do we appreciate what an honor, what an undeserved privilege that is? I think too often we take that for granted. I know we do, myself included, because I see how I act sometimes. And I see how sometimes how my brethren act. And I think we're taking that for granted. It's easy to do if we're not careful. But let's remember, and I was taught when I was growing up, and I grew up in the country, but one of the things that country folks really, really, and it's not just a country folk thing, but one of the things I was really had impressed upon me is you protect the family name. Granddaddy would say, you know, I worked hard to earn a good name around here in this community. And I don't want my children, I don't want my grandchildren going around and tarnishing that good name. Let's make sure, brothers and sisters, that we don't tarnish the name Christ, Christian. Tell people I'm a Christian and then act like the world, talk like the world, dress like the world. Well, we can tarnish that, that good name. In Romans 8, 16 and 17, Paul says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And he goes on in verse 17, he says, If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Again, do we stop and think about that? Joint heirs with Christ? We have the opportunity to be royalty. As one fellow said, when, you're, when your father is the king... He is able. There's nothing he can't do. We sometimes sing the little kid song, what? My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Paul said that in Ephesians 3.20. He said, now unto him who is able to do exceeding, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church. Through Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without him. When you're a child of the king, there's nothing your father cannot do. What a blessed thought. The blue reminds us of royalty. And then let's close out noticing that the stars, the stars make us think of heaven. You know, heaven is the place of ultimate freedom. That is the place where we can be ultimately free. It's freedom from death, from sorrow, from pain. Revelation 21, 4, he says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Heaven is freedom from death and, and any kind of sorrow and suffering, pain. All those things are done away in heaven. Oh, the stars remind us of heaven, and heaven reminds us of true freedom. It's also freedom from sin. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Sometimes it's so frustrating to deal with some of the sinful, awful behavior that people engage in here on this earth. There are drunkards and murderers and all kinds of uh, extortioners and thieves and things like that. We don't have to worry about that in heaven. Revelation 21, 27 says, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth or maketh the abomin or, or whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Heaven is a place of, of freedom. Jesus tells us that he's preparing a place for us. John 14, 1 to 6, he said, you believe in God. Or it starts off, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. But you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Whither I go, you know, and the way you know. Of course, Thomas says, verse 5, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus says, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus says, if you want the ultimate freedom, you have to come through me. That's not a, meant to be a threatening thing. That's a comforting thing because he's the good shepherd that we read about in Psalm 23. He's the good shepherd as he defines himself in John chapter 10. Jesus is preparing a place for us if we're his children. Matthew 13, 43, Jesus said, The righteous will shine forth as the sun 
in the kingdom of their father. One of the things we learned very early on in, in school is that the sun is a, a star. And it's ironic because you learn, uh, I remember learning later on in school that the ironic thing about the sun is it's actually not one of the bigger stars in the system, but it's a star. And so Jesus says the righteous are going to shine forth as the sun. And so I see those stars and I think about shining forth as the sun in the kingdom of the Father when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. As we think about independence, let's think about the ultimate freedom, and that's heaven. But you can't have that if you're not in Christ. That's true freedom. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Backing up to verse 31 of John chapter 8, he says, If you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they go on and they say, well, we be Abraham's seed and were never in bondage to any man, which was not true, of course. They were in bondage to the Romans at the very moment they said that. But they said, well, we're Abraham's seed, we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou you shall be made free? Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. You know what? We're all at some point or another in bondage to sin. But you can be a child of God. You can have your life right with him. You can have freedom. Jesus goes on, he says, the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore make you free, you shall be free indeed. What about you this morning? Do you want the ultimate freedom? That's in heaven, but it's only for those who are God's children. Maybe you need to be washed in the blood of the lamb. You can come and obey the gospel. Maybe you need to be restored back to faithful service. Maybe there's something we can do just to encourage you, to pray for you, to help you to be the kind of person God would have you to be. Heaven's invitation is extended. If the Son makes you free, you'll be free indeed. Won't you come as we stand and sing? God is calling the prodigal come without delay. Here or here in Bali, Bali now.
pass that to the center aisle and be picked up in our clothing song, which is number 597, and then we'll have a prayer. 597. My heavenly home is bright and fair, I feel like traveling on. No pain, no death can enter there, I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on, I feel like traveling on. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being here with us today. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for hearing the lessons that we prepared. We thank you for those that prepared those lessons. We're most thankful for your word that those lessons came from. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be with the Lowe family. We pray that you'll comfort them. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be with those traveling to and from destinations. And our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll be with us, that we'll be the right examples. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs> 